Hey everybody, welcome back to the Old Sweets Farm. It's Rich. I'm going to do a request video. I've done a couple of videos on uh, HF, radio propagation, and how radio waves uh, bounce and their distance and all that. Um, and some people asked me about doing a VHF, UHF. So these are the very high frequencies, the ultra high frequencies. I'm going to try to not do much video outside today because it is so windy here on the plains, um, as you can tell. I want to tell you just a little bit about VHF, UHF and what I do. I'll explain more inside, but I want to show you the antennas. Now my antennas, this is not optimum, but it does show you what you can do. I've got some pretty basic beam antennas. I do a lot of sideband and CW work. So sideband meaning voice or a CW which is Morse code. I that's my mode of communication. I'm not on FM, so I am not going to talk about FM. I'm not on the digital uh, stuff. I'm not an FT8, FT4 guy at all. I don't believe in that. I don't need to talk much about it, but I want to earn my contacts, and I do it. I let the decoding be done in my brain, so I will show you what you can do. Let me turn this around a little bit. This, these are just kind of some temporary antennas. We've got this corn crib here, and I lashed a couple tower sections to it. Um, that's a four element, six meter beam. It's a high gain, I think it's called like high gain 64 BS, something like that. Um, so four elements on six meters. Above it, and the six meter beam is probably at 20 feet. Again, not optimum, especially with that metal top on the corn crib. There's some interaction when I turn it certain directions, but it works. The one above that, uh, five, six, seven, eight, nine, yeah, it is. I think it's a 12 element uh, K1 FO design. It's like an FO12 for two meters or 144 megahertz. And above that is, I believe that's a 24 element uh, K1 FO design for 432. Now you will notice that I didn't do a good job of attaching the feed line and this winter with some winds and vibration the 432 feed line came unattached so I didn't want to change that out in the winter so uh, there's a spring project for me. So there's my antennas not optimum uh, at all. I would like them higher I would like them maybe longer or stack um, but I'll talk about gain, antennas, power, all that from inside so you're not dealing with the wind. If this has been breezy here at the start, I apologize. So let's, uh, I'll take you inside and explain the rest of it. Hey everybody, I'm inside. I want to give you a little background on me and my uh, love of VHF and also then walk you through some of the different propagation modes that really make VHF fun. Um, so to back up, my grandpa got me involved in ham radio. He never got his license, but he had, across the room here, a Holocrafters receiver that I've still got, an old Holocrafters from the 60s. And we'd go down in his basement and listen to people all over the world. And that just absolutely, I was bitten. I wanted to talk to those people, not just listen. I wanted to talk to those people. He also subscribed to a magazine called QST, and that's the official magazine from, I don't have one right around here, but that's the official magazine of the ARRL. -R 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 -L. Um, and in those pages of old QSTs from the 60s that he had, and this is me uh, in the late 70s uh, and early 80s, right when I got my license, there's a column called the world above 50 megacycles at the time. Now it's the world above 50 megahertz. And it talked about people using 50 megahertz or six meters on up. And one thing that caught me was the discussion about two meters or 144 megahertz. And people were using different propagation modes to talk out, you know, 500 miles, a thousand miles, talking to all these different states. And I remember reading that and saying, that's what I want to do. I love the challenge. I don't like something that's so easy uh, that anybody can do it. Um, I want the challenge. And so when I got my ham radio license, I wanted to get on VHF. Luckily, I had a, a local ham, John, 
who has helped me out invaluably over the years. Um, and John was bitten by VHF, UHF as well. And so he was a perfect Elmer or perfect helper for me. Um, and I got on. And two meters, I'll talk mostly about two meters here and the propagation modes because I think two meters is one of the funnest bands that we as ham radio operators have. Two meters offers a lot of different propagation modes. And I want two meters, 144 megahertz, so it's above the FM band. So think about getting in your car radio, uh, you're getting in your car, turn on the radio, and being able to talk to all over the place or listen to stations all around. And occasionally you can. Uh, it, that's a lot of fun. So I'll, I'll talk to that in a bit. Um, at the end of this video, I'm also going to put uh, a clip of uh, some sporadic E. So what I'm going to talk about is tropospheric uh, bending or tropospheric enhancement, ducting. I'm going to talk about meteor scatter. I'm going to talk about aurora. And I'm going to talk about sporadic E. I'm going to talk about, like I did outside, talk about using sideband and CW, the weak signal modes. I am not going to talk about digital. For me, digital is not, it's a great um, propagation tool, but for me to use that to make contact, no. I want to decode up here. If the computer decodes it and you couldn't even hear the signal, but the only way you make the contact is with a computer, in my book, that doesn't count. A lot of people will disagree, and it's a very hot topic. I'm going to talk about just using your voice or Morse code, CW. I have had all sorts of different rigs over the years. Um, also, I should say, I'm not going to talk about FM. Uh, I just I don't use it enough uh, at all. I don't talk on repeaters, so um, I'm not going to talk about that. So sideband, CW. I've had a whole bunch of different radios over time. I've had single radios that uh, are used for one frequency, you know, one radio for six meters, one for two meters, one for 432, uh, 432 megahertz, one for 1 1.2 gigahertz. Right now, what I use, and I've talked about it in the other things, I don't have it hooked up right now, I uh, just had it out uh, mobile, but uh, is my uh, Yesu 991. It's got six meters, two meters, and 432 megahertz. But this is my two meter rig. Well, this is all my rigs right here. And then I use different uh, amplifiers. This puts out lower power. You, you can do all these propagation modes that I'm going to talk about barefoot, meaning no amplifier on this. What I'm going to suggest is if you're serious about VHF, UHF, is you get an amplifier. This only has, I think it's 25 watts out on two meters and while you can talk uh, with 25 watts, it is much better, maybe it's 50 watts, uh, it's much better to have an amplifier and get a little bit of power. Now you saw my beam that I had outside. Those beams are not um, optimum. Should I have them up at 50, 75 feet? That would be great. Um, I've got my 2 meter Yagi, the, the middle antenna that was shown out there is a 12 element Yagi and I think it's at about 22 feet so it's not optimum at all. I've talked all over the place with that. What I do have right now is a, an amplifier. Hopefully you can see that back here. I didn't want to unhook it all. It's from a company called TE Systems. Now there's plenty of amplifiers out there um, from different companies. Um, why I went with TE Systems is I like the preamp. One thing you're going to get with most of these brick bricks is an amplifier. You're going to amplify your power out. Um, typically, they take 10 watts in and amplify it to, let's say, 150 watts or 160 watts. This one takes, uh, it's very hot, but it, it drives with 5 watts from my 991, and I get almost 400 watts out with this amplifier. So it's a real nice power boost. But it's also got a pre-amplifier. It takes the signal coming in and amplifies, pre-amplifies the signal coming into the radio. That's a big help when you've got marginal conditions and you're, you need that extra boost to hear the other station. Again, I'm human decoding. I'm not letting the computer do all the work for me. So I want to be able to hear that person or hear that Morse code signal come through. Um, and a brick is great. Most of my career, 
most of my career on uh, VHF UHF, I have had 150 watt brick. I've put out 150 watts on two meters, um, and that has done well. My accomplishments on two meters, I have talked coast to coast. I have, I have not talked to Alaska, Hawaii. I have talked to California, but I can't get a QSL card from him. I have not talked to uh, Oregon, and I have not talked to Nevada. So I have 45 states talked to and confirmed on two meters uh, using voice and, and or Morse code. So that's a huge accomplishment. I would like to get all 48 of the lower states, but I've got a couple more to go. I'm still trying. Um, and those are all out at the furthest distance away. Now, let me get something here. When you're on VHF UHF, you're going to use grid squares. And you're going to get familiar with using grid squares. And I color them in when I talk to them. Um, and I have 200 and, I don't know, 225 grids confirmed. I've talked to more, but getting QSL cards uh, or getting confirmations is a little tough. Um, but I have, two, I think, 220 or 225 confirmed grids. And again, the 45 states on two meters. Now, I've used a whole bunch of different propagation modes to uh, talk to those grids. And I'm going to, let me go into them here and explain. But all of it was used. A nice simple radio, microphone, headphones, an amplifier, and a preamplifier, and nothing more than a 12 element. I think the most I've ever had was a, a 15 element Yagi, um, maybe at 40 feet at my old house. Uh, so, not huge station, uh, but with these propagation modes, it all works. It all works. So, it does take time. I, I will say some of these things don't happen every year. Um, some things it's a year in between uh, where you talk out and work something new. Um, I've been at my current location for five years now and uh, have talked to probably 35 or 40 states uh, using the various modes. So if you know what to look for, you can do it. The first thing I talk about is tropospheric enhancement um, or ducting and you're going to get that um, it's all within, you know, the weather layer. Um, on one of my past videos, I had the had the little chart here that showed the, the D layer, the E layer, and the F layer. And here's all the weather. Well, this tropospheric enhancement is down here in the weather layer. Um, you'll get, or will get, I'm talking, not a lot of the stuff I'm talking from Minnesota. So uh, realize I'm kind of in the sweet spot where I can talk all around the country. But I also have conditions here that you might not get in other parts of the country, and I'll, I'll talk to that. But all of this tropospheric enhancement is way down here in the weather, in the troposphere, down here in the weather. Uh, we'll get um, a sluggish, high-pressure system. Um, you get an inversion, is basically what happens. Uh, we'll get a, a sluggish, high-pressure system coming through in late summer, really slow-moving, and as the evening uh, wears on, the ground that was heated um, lets off that heat and you get heat above a layer of cooler air and you're able to get a signal trapped between that warm air, that inversion. Usually the temperature gets cooler as it goes up. You get a warm layer up there and the radio signals are able to ride along between that warm higher air and the cooler air below. And you can talk out quite a distance. I did not record it, but I had my best tropo this past summer, um, a slow, sluggish pressure system, and I, I'm up in Minnesota, and I was able to talk down to Echo Mike 60, so on two meters all the way down, um, it was a thousand miles, uh, almost, it was like a thousand twelve miles, it's the longest I've ever talked on tropo, but it the gentleman down there was in all evening and then in the morning I made a call and he was still there. Um, conditions were very good. Now I've been on VHF for 40 years and that's the longest I've talked. Um, the furthest I've talked I should say. Um, and it was incredible. Uh, others in my area were not hearing him. Others in his area were not hearing me. It was the perfect 
the weather was lined up perfect for the two of us and he had a great signal and I had talked to him on another uh, propagation mode the summer before so it's pretty interesting but a thousand miles most of what you're going to talk to you know I'm in EN 34 and most of what you're going to work on this tropospheric enhancement is out five six hundred maybe seven hundred miles um, occasionally we'll get down into Georgia and Kentucky you know eight hundred nine hundred miles or down into Texas straight south um, another time where you get that inversion you get a cold front coming through and sometimes cold fronts have very violent weather uh, in the summer here they a cold front comes through and there's a chance for thunderstorms tornadoes it's that wedge of cold air coming through underneath warm air and pushing it up and when you get that cold air right underneath that cold front coming and the warm air above sometimes you can point along that front and do the same thing I've talked down to Texas uh, right before a cold front came through and just had some severe weather and we talked 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 and then the weather gets too close and the uh, inversion is gone uh, and you don't want to be on the air with lightning so tropo you can talk out you know there's sometimes where you just get a calm morning uh, in the summer where there's warmer uh, or yeah warmer air above cooler air and you can talk out three four hundred miles no problem and you'll get that several hundred times it's these longer inversions uh, or maybe once a summer we haven't had one this good that one talking down to southern Alabama we haven't had one like that in a long time so uh, it, it's rare but if you know what to look for you can watch um, and I'll put some links down below but there's a uh, let me see I'm not sure how this will show up on camera but this is and I'll put all these links down below but this is one way to look at it these are called the Hepburn charts and it will show it'll predict um, tropospheric uh, enhancement and you can click ahead um, you know and, and look you know a day ahead click through it and and see the how the tropo starts to change from one day to the next so um, really interesting another is a good aid uh, to look at um, but I'll put all the all the little websites to watch so you can kind of keep that on and, and check that the next thing I want to talk about is meteor scatter and meteor scatter can be a lot of fun um, how do you predict it well you know when the main meteor showers are the biggest kind of for radio use is the Perseids in August and you know you can read online when they're gonna peak um, people know when those are when the Geminids are when the, all the different showers the Leonids when they are and what happens during a meteor shower you know we talked about E layer propagation uh, up in the E layer um, meteors will come through you know you'll see them visually you can go out and watch meteors come through and you see that bright light uh, very short as it comes through and you might get something like a grain of sand that that burning you see is it's coming in past the E layer but as it burns through the E layer it ionizes and charges part of that E layer on two meters also on six meters 50 megahertz or 144 megahertz but on two meters you can when it's charged your radio signal will bounce off that E layer now a grain of sand might give you a split second of ionization or that charge in the E layer or you might get something that's a bigger rock coming through and you might get 30 seconds occasionally you'll get what old old guys used to call a blue whizzer and it'll charge and you're, you're trying to communicate with someone and you're only getting little bits of information and then a big rock comes through that blue whizzer and signals are s9 plus on your your meter you're able to talk to the guy for 30 seconds you know and exchange your grid talk about the weather quickly and then the charge is gone and he's out or if you're a good operator and you, you hear something you, you make very short calls you know you give his call your call your grid he confirms your grid and gives his and then you say QRZ and the next guy you can maybe get two or three guys in sometimes 
usually the the grains of sand uh, grains coming through are so small you're getting a letter here or there you need to exchange information get calls and grids back and forth and sometimes using traditional way of voice or some people use very high speed uh, Morse code or CW it can take a while to get all that information but those those charges in the E layer let you talk out further you know where I said tropospheric stuff I'm talking out five six hundred miles all of a sudden now with meteor scatter I'm talking out 500 to a thousand miles or a little further um, I've talked down to Florida I've talked to a lot of guys on the East Coast my last new state that I talked to uh, was on meteor scatter and it was uh, Rhode, Rhode Island and uh, there it is out there. So I was talking, I was about, uh, I don't know, 1,100 miles, I think, talking out there. So um, good distance. A lot of this stuff is meteor scatter out to the west. You know, there's not as much population out here, so there's not as many grids worked. But a lot of this is meteor scatter out 1,000 miles or so. You know when the showers are. You can line up with a station and say, you know, contact them on their email. Say, hey, I'd like to talk to you and line up a time when you're going to be pointed at them, they're pointed at you, you know the schedule of this 15 seconds I'm transmitting that I'm listening for your 15 seconds and you go back and forth and if the meteors are good you work. So a very fun mode it's more used with computers these days and letting the computer talk to the computer so there's not as many guys doing it but it is fun. Um, and as far as prediction or using websites you know when the when the meteor showers are. Now the next one I'm going to talk about is Aurora and Aurora is there's a couple of different sites there's a NOAA site you can look again I'll put these sites down below there's a couple of Aurora sites to watch um, I can take part in Aurora because I'm north some of you guys if you're listening and you're down in Florida Texas uh, out here it's gonna be a heck of an Aurora for you to get involved in it um, Aurora, when you see those northern lights up, up north, that is the energy from the sun uh, coming in and heading towards the pole and charging up um, the ionosphere. And you see those clouds moving back and forth, uh, those uh, auroral clouds. When you're using uh, two meters, let's just say, it's a good, uh, Aurora can be worked on six meters, two meters, very rarely on 222 or 432 very rare it's got to be a very strong aurora and both stations need to be very well equipped at those frequencies but at two meters with 150 watts and a small antenna like I've got 12 elements not a problem when you've got the aurora you can point north or northeast at the uh, at the aurora and if another station is pointed there on the same frequency you'll hear each other most of the time you're going to use Morse code, you're going to use CW. Um, as those clouds shift, as they're moving, that aurora is constantly moving, your CW signal is not a pure tone. Um, it is distorted by that cloud that moves. Um, and so, I don't know if I can do it well, but uh, some, it's like a whisper sometimes. It's, you know, instead of the do 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 do, you'll, you'll hear this something like that or it'll be sometimes it'll be really coarse and, and it'll be kind of a you'll hear that uh, raspy note and if you hear that you know right away it's Aurora swing your beam to the north um, and exchange grids uh, not every visual Aurora will give radio Aurora um, so some of the the sites to watch you know you can see if there's sites if there's an aurora and word gets around that there's aurora, I point north, northeast, and uh, I just call CQ. And uh, uh, CQ, and sometimes I'll do, call CQAU, meaning aurora, and that person that hears it, they know that I'm looking north uh, for aurora. Um, the bigger the aurora, the further south we'll be able to work. So, you know, I'm able to work, you know, several hundred miles out. And I'm working mostly these northern northern grids. You know, I'll work over to New York and Pennsylvania quite a bit. You know, 700 miles or so from from me, um, and maybe down into Ohio, 
occasionally Kentucky, you know, Missouri will be coming through, Nebraska, uh, occasionally Montana. But it's got to be a heck of an aurora where I start getting further south. If I get down into um, Virginia or some of that or down into Kentucky, Tennessee, it's a good aurora. It's very rare that I don't or that I get that far south. Um, occasionally, the aurora will get so intense, and it's very rare, that you know all this is going on in the E layer, uh, this charging, and so it'll charge up enough with the aurora where all of a sudden your tone will go clear. It will be a pure tone, and you can switch over to voice quick and maybe work out to, I've talked to Maine, New Hampshire, New York, on a pure tone, and then switched over to voice. It's auroral E, so it's E skip. And we're going to talk about sporadic E in just a second here, but it'll get so charged that it charges an ionos ion charges the ionosphere at the E layer, and you're able to talk uh, using voice. It's very rare. It's got to be a severe geomagnetic storm to uh, to get out that far. But occasionally you're able to talk out uh, using sporadic E. Um, or auroral E is what they call it. Um, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun. Aurora is a lot of fun. Uh, it's a way, you know, tropo, I'm getting a certain part of the map. Aurora, I can get a different part of the map. Um, talked about uh, meteor scatter. You can fill in another set of the, the map. And then this last mode that I'm going to talk about is called sporadic E. Um, it's in the E layer. It is... Uh, sporadic like they say if if i hear it one time a summer uh, it's good uh have i worked it multiple times in a summer yep uh last summer uh, there were two openings uh on sporadic e sometimes it can be for a minute or two sometimes it'll be for a couple hours um how it works is during the peak uh solar time the summer you know our our so we get more um, sun in the summer here in the northern hemisphere, June, um, the sun peaks. Somewhere starting in May and then going all the way into August, um, that radiation from the sun, that uh, uh, intense, uh, well, there, there's the solar activity gets it going. They don't know exactly what causes this. Uh, it's up in the E layer. Is it charged particles that with wind shear? are pulling them in different directions and they're charged. Um, some have said that it's higher up, you know, maybe big thunderheads are causing it. I, I don't know. Uh, all I know is as the, it's usable on 10 meters, you'll, you'll be able to talk out, say 1500 miles, all of a sudden you'll get skip. That's what a lot of people call it. Work, old CB days, guys would work skip. 10 meters, they'll work it and you, you, all of a sudden you start hearing Florida stations coming in. Same with six meters. It bounces out about 1,500 miles when, it, when the MUF or the maximum usable frequency is right at six meters. It's about 1,500 miles. As the MUF goes up, the usable frequency goes up, the, the skip gets shorter and shorter. So you can work, say, 1,500 miles. You can, you know, you're bouncing it off whatever is causing it, that wind shear with those charged particles, uh, solar radi radiation, it's all in the E layer, thus it's called sporadic E, but it's in that E layer, and so you're able to bounce off the E layer, off this charged cloud, and talk out about 1,500 miles. Now that cloud will move, um, and typically what I've noticed is they work, they move from east to west, so I'll be working very loud stations out you know, in the Carolinas or so, or Georgia, and then that, that cloud in the middle is moving, and then I'm working to Alabama and then Louisiana. Kind of this is, and I'm talking six meters here now because it's much more frequent in the summer. In the evening or late morning, you'll get sporadic E on six meters quite frequently, especially in June. Does it get to two meters very often? No, again, one or two times a summer. When it comes, it is fun. Uh, all of a sudden stations on two meters, 144 megahertz down here. All this stuff was worked on sporadic E. Uh, most of this stuff all here um, on sporadic E. You're talking out 1,200 miles, 1,300 miles. 
signals typically are very loud, very strong. Could I do it barefoot with my, my 991? You bet. Um, I've talked to many 10 watt stations, guys who are out for field day and there's some two meter uh, E and they're talking on a small field day setup with 25 watts and a very small antenna. You increase your chances when you've got a bigger station with a, a beam antenna like I've got outside and an amplifier, but it is really fun. I'm going to put a video at the end of this showing sporadic E and it was me working, or not me, I had just worked this station and then I put the put my phone on and recorded him working someone nearby here. But it was a station, um, I think it was out in FN67, uh, a VE2, I'm sorry, VE9. I had been working, uh, there was some sporadic he had been working VE2s and this VE9 came through and I worked him very loud signals. Um, I'm looking for a QSL card from you. If, if you are, if you see this, you see yourself on here, I'd, I'd love a QSL card, by the way, because I need your grid. I think it was FN67. But the video you're going to see, I recorded it last summer, and it's over 1,200 miles away. Uh, I, get, I wrote down here on a little card. Oh, VE9WGD. VE9WGD, if you're watching this, I need your QSL card. Um, but it's 1,238 miles away on two meters. A um, lot of fun. That's the first time in, in my 30 plus or 40 plus years of, uh, of being on two meters. That's the only time I've ever heard VE9 coming through to me. Um, it, just conditions were right. And that's the fun of VHF. You never know where, what conditions could be there or where you're going to talk. Um, some things to watch um, for sporadic E. Um, there's a, a couple of spots. Um, this is DX Maps, and this map, now, I'll put the link down below, but it, what it's showing me is, above each grid square, what the MUF is, what's the maximum usable frequency. So um, there's some that I see there that are 72 or 56 megahertz. So there might be some sporadic E for 6 meters today as I'm filming this, um, but what I'm looking for is a cloud... You know, I'm looking for some clouds where the muff is above six meters out here, you know, five, six hundred miles away, because that's my midpoint where I'm going to be able to bounce the signal off that cloud down into Florida. Um, as I see the muff go up, the maximum usable frequency, if I start seeing it get near two meters, I'm getting on two meters and I'm starting to call. I'm looking that direction, I'm calling. Also, over time, and this is hard to explain, but over time I've got this sense, I don't know what it is. There is a, I believe, a low rumble on two meters, right at 144, 200, the calling frequency. I'll hear this rumble, and what I think it is, it's VHFers that are on, and the, the sporadic E hasn't quite reached two meters, but it's close. And so I'm getting little bits of their signal. I'm hearing a, a rumble, I call it. And you just start hearing that rumble, and I just... I don't know, it's something I, over decades that I've just heard, but I'll start calling. And more times, well, that's 50-50 maybe, but the band will open pretty soon after that. I, I just, it's just a feeling, it's a sound that I've heard, but as the muff goes up, when it gets to two meters, um, the skip zone on six meters is pretty short. It's probably, you're probably skipping out 500 miles, but then two meters will open and it'll be a thousand or 1,200 or 1,400 miles, and I've worked down in southern Florida. Um, sporadic E on six meters can be many different clouds. If they're lined up together, you can talk one hop to Florida, the next hop to Puerto Rico, the next hop down further in the Caribbean. So you can have multi-hop, or you can have multi-hop uh, sporadic E in the summer to Europe or to Japan. Um, and I've done that, and that's a lot of fun. All of a sudden, they're there. It's not very loud, it's not very long, but they're there. But for two meters, it's usually only one hop. Um, but you can fill in these grids that are out. You know, I've had it down to Arizona, Texas, down in the southern states, Florida, out to the east coast of Maine. This video that's going to come up here at the end um, is a VE9, now 1,200 miles. But if you use tropospheric enhancement, meteor scatter, aurora, sporadic E, 
you can talk to a lot of states, a lot of grids, have a lot of fun on there. So I'll end it with that. If you got questions about VHF, um, I should say on a normal day on two meters, I can talk out two, three, four hundred miles, no problem. But this is some, if you get questions, put them down below. Um, if you've had other, you got other questions or have other experiences, let me know that. Otherwise, stay tuned. I'll click off here and then we'll go to that video of VE9 WGD coming through from 1200 miles via sporadic E. Thanks everybody for watching. Hope this uh, helps you and gets you on VHF, the weak signal modes. Take care. Okay, no problem. You're 5-9, 59 into Foxtrot, November 5-7, sir.